George Ferguson. I was the directly elected mayor of Bristol most recently. I'm an architect and uh, general social and cultural entrepreneur. Now, you're one of the people who's been putting together this uh, project, Our World Bristol, which is a, a vision for the zoo site, which they're talking about uh, selling off. But what do you, as an architect, bring to this? Because I think a lot of it is about creating a place. Obviously, the zoo, for many Bristolians, is a fantastic place to be. And it's terrible. It's tragic that it's going to be out of walking distance. They're moving it away. What, what's, how does this all link into your expertise as an architect? Well, I always see myself primarily as an urbanist, a placemaker, and um, architects build objects, and placemakers make stuff happen. And um, I've spent my life making things happen in, in appropriate places in cities, and I'm a strong believer in attractions being accessible to people, not being car-dependent, being... Uh, places that are part of a community and so I've known the zoo all, all my life in Bristol for the past 55 years um, and uh, it's I've always found it an attractive place but I think I've got an increasing distaste for zoos as they are I think gawping at animals in cages is not the way forward and I think the zoo understands that and that's why they want to move um, but I reacted pretty badly to the suggestion that the zoo should become yet another posh housing site uh, in order to raise money to move the zoo out of town and that's where it all started. Well, why does it matter where the zoo is? Surely if it's near the motorway, it's going to be much more accessible to more people. It's going to be more accessible to people with cars. It's going to be less accessible to people who live in the city and rely on public transport or cycling or walking even. Um, so, well, and tourists, I suppose, as well, who are in Clifton. And tourists. Uh, tourists are much more likely not... Uh, tour- they're likely to arrive without a car. Um, and so uh, uh, Clifton is already a tourist attraction. Um, and this is probably one of the prime reasons why people come to this area of Bristol. It's also on the edge of the Downs, on the edge of the Gorge. It's a wonderfully biodiverse, rich area. And um, the zoo should be... a, a a springboard for all that activity. The zoo should be a richly biodiverse garden. It's nearly 12 acres. Um, It's a wonderfully mature garden. It was founded in 1835 by Henry Riley, a physician, who incidentally discovered the fourth dinosaur in the world before people even knew what dinosaurs were, before they had a name, on the edge of the Downs. So... Um, it has an amazing history. And then Henry Riley got Brunel in as one of the founding partners. Uh, it's the oldest provincial zoo in the world. It's the, you know, it's the first non-capital zoo in the world. It's the fifth zoo of any type in the world. It's, it's a very, very precious thing. Um, of course, we need to reinvent. And so rather than just being anti the idea of it becoming a posh housing development... Um, I thought we should come up with an alternative and we got a group of people together, um, other people who happened to be like-minded at the same time. We were thrown together and we have become the sponsors for what we call Our World Bristol, which is incredible bit of serendipity because it brings together um, people in this region, in the southwest region, who have all the expertise uh, to produce this new vision of a zoo. What I'm sure Justin Morris, uh, the d- current zoo director, will be saying is, I'm afraid this old model of the provincial zoo, great and, and ancient though it is, just isn't financially viable anymore. That's right, and that's why you have to be more imaginative. I mean, they're relying on advice from KPMG and, uh, you know, big accountants and property agents. Nothing really interesting has happened in the world that relies on the advice of big accountants and property agents. And so, you know, the, we're thinking the art of the impossible. 
Eden was the the Eden project was the art of the impossible. There are so many, you know, the 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 uh, what's now called We the Curious would never have happened if we'd just listened to the accountants. The, you know, so many of the wonderful projects that have happened in this city, in this country, in this world, are the result of people thinking out of the box. So this is thinking out of the box, but together with people in Bristol University, in the BBC Natural History Unit, um, in our local theatres. Um, we've got film directors involved, Stephen Daldry, who is uh, the director of The Crown, and um, Billy Elliot and other things is one of the principal prime movers. Um, we've got educators involved, the Cabot Learning Project uh, the, uh, that, that runs some, some of the academies, Cabot Learning Federation, um, Boom Satsuma, which is uh, creative education for um, secondary and higher education. Um, so we have a fa- fantastic group of of people involved. We've got foodies involved because um, I see that you know food must be at the heart of many things we do, and food education is really important. We've got climate scientists involved. So um, this, um, and we've got people with money and people who are prepared to put money into something that they believe is uh, that that the time is right for, especially at all the discussion that's going on about the threats to biodiversity across the world. They're going to be sticking their necks out, these people. This sort of thing hasn't really been done much before, has it? I suppose, you know, it's the same sort of spirit that put the the zoo there back in the 1800s in the first place. Exactly the same spirit. And it fits their purposes. Um, Now, uh, the zoo trustees are saying to us, yeah, but our purpose now is to raise as much money from the sites we possibly can by whatever means in order to be able to invest it in what I, you know, in, invested in their new project. Um, I think their prime purpose should be putting the, the site that they've inherited from 1835 uh, to best possible use. That should be their prime purpose. So is and it their land or are they leasing it? It's their land. Um, so we have to, to a certain extent, work with them. We have talked about collaboration uh, and we've had some good meetings with them, but um, they still are still charging ahead. They've, uh, with, their, with their housing plan, they've appointed architects, good architects, but nevertheless, it's a matter of principle. You know, a, a better designed housing estate is only fractionally better than a badly designed housing estate. It's having a housing estate at all on this very precious historic site seems philistine to me. We we, we are losing a lot of shared spaces, aren't we, around the city, all all over the city. This is public space by all, you know, maybe owned by the zoo trustees and the shareholders, but it is to all intents and purposes a public space, and um, it's... uh, (laughs) You know, it's one of the things that defines this city. And we can't sell out everything. This is, you know, we don't want to asset strip Bristol. We want to invest in the things that, are, that, the, that the people of Bristol value. And I know that, there's, that it's been inaccessible to a lot of the people of Bristol. I think it's really important that... A zoo for tomorrow is much more accessible. It's accessible to the schools, it's accessible to the people who can't afford to pay the sort of prices that you have to pay to go into the zoo, that it should be laired in its use so that it can be used at different times of day for different purposes, that involves other organisations. Um, you know, some, you know, Bristol is the Hollywood of um, natural history filmmaking, more than half of the natural history filming of the world happens in Bristol. I don't think we champion that enough, that this could be very much a base for that. Um, You know, we have Wild Screen, we have so much to do with animal life in Bristol. Um, To take that, the heart of that, uh, out of Bristol seems so wrong. And so this is an opportunity to do so much more than the zoo currently does and be much more immersive. I mean... I wonder what gawping in an animal in a cage does for 
education. I don't think it does very much. Well, there's a lot of um, people our age, George, in, brought up in Bristol. So many school trips would have been to that zoo to do exactly that, to gawp at the animals. Absolutely. And I think we probably enjoyed it, but we've moved on. You know, it, we've moved on from uh, in terms of understanding uh, that animals are sentient beasts that uh, are currently in Parliament. They're debating that. And um, we need to have more respect for animals and their lives. Now, okay, well just can you take us through this whole idea of, uh, you know, the, the zoo of tomorrow? What would it look like? I mean, the idea of digital animals? Or, you know, that does sound a little bit peculiar. No, real animals, first of all, that are attracted by the, uh, by the wild place that, that they're in. I use wild place Funnily enough, that's the term that the zoo uses out in their um, in their new zoo. But digital anim- uh, 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 digitizing is a, an, another layer. So what we want is a highly biodiverse garden that attracts the bees, the bugs, the butterflies, the birds, the pond life, um, the creepy crawlies. So small animals that are naturally att- attracted. Uh, or or kept in that place because they want to be in that place because of the plants because of the um, the the nature of the place then that is layered over by augmented reality that uses the place but enables people to imagine or even to experience being a bee in a beehive or being a caterpillar with the caterpillars so uh, the technology for that is being developed by a project called My World at the University of Bristol, which is a massive project. Um, Bristol is at the heart of this development of these new technologies. It also would enable you to travel in time, so not only in scale, but also in time, so you could be on the downs, which are adjacent to the zoo, um, prior to the Ice Age. You could mammoths used to walk walk across the downs so the you know they have been discovered on the downs um the uh the um the the gorge was formed in the ice age you know so you could you could experience all those things that is much much more of a learning project than wandering around a zoo and as i say gawping at animals behind bars. Okay, well this sounds like an interesting new sort of technology, but it could really be anywhere. It doesn't have to be there, does it? It could be, you know, in a in, right in the down in the city centre, you know, by the docks. Uh, it could be anywhere. I think it could be adapted to any place. <clears throat> but there is something about the history of place, the location, the fact that it is by um, by the Downs, uh, by by the part of the Avon Gorge, um, that you can use the place. The whole difference with augmented reality and pure virtual reality is that augmented reality uses the place. It makes it much more interesting. If you were just in a warehouse down in St Phillips behind the station, for instance, it would be pure virtual reality. You would have to um, you, you you would have to create uh, the habitat in which these things happen um, in, within that uh, virtual reality. Augmented reality enables you to use the place. Another um, technology we're looking at is connecting to habitats across the world. So, um, and again, this could, to a certain extent, happen from any place. So we're not arguing that this is unique to this place, but this place is unique and it would create a particularly special first version of this alternative zoo. And we say a first version because we think this is much more than about Bristol. We do think that this is going to be the answer to uh, the future of zoos across the world or an answer to zoos across the world. And let's hope that they're diverse and different but they make use of the place they're in so that they are distinctive rather than just anywhere um, experiences. It's almost, you know, you could probably do that sort of thing at home as well if you were going to do complete virtual re- reality. But anyway, I approached, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I approached Justin Morris at the zoo yeah. to ask him, you know, what, what his plans are for the site and what, maybe to what he thought about this project. He didn't want to be interviewed. Well, that is... Um, yeah, as you know, I'm always up for being interviewed because I think uh, you shouldn't hide. Um, and um, 
I mean, at I the end of the day, this is his decision. It sounds to me as if he's already going ahead, he's ignoring others, and he's just going to go ahead with the move out to the M5. And uh, it, in a way, you know, this is it's a great proposal, but it doesn't sound as if the zoo are really interested. The zoo are interested in getting planning permission to build, I think it's 340 apartments on the site. In no way are those going to be affordable apartments. I think it's the planning decision is the councillor's decision. The planning in this city is run, as it is in most local authorities, by planning departments that report to planning committees. The planning committees make the decision, not the mayor. The planning, com- the planning committees are quasi-judicial committees. They make the decision in the best interests of the people of Bristol. So I think it's up to them. If they decide it's in the best interests of the people of Bristol to build a um, housing estate on that on the zoo, well, um, it's got to get, then, it's got to get what's get called a, a change of use, isn't it? It's completely yeah. changing yeah, the use. So there's a this is a this is actually quite an obstacle through the planning system that they've still got to go through. It, it is a huge obstacle. So while the zoo might decide that's what they want to do, in effect, it will be the planners that decide whether that's legitimate or not. If they decide it's legitimate, then the site becomes worth, say, £40 million. If they decide it's not legitimate and something like ours as or other alternatives uh, are the way forward, then the site is probably worth at most half as, half as much, 15 or £20 million. Um, we have people who would be willing to consider the purchase of the site at that sort of value, but not at an inflated, um, an inflated housing value site. And so I think the key decision is going to be the planning decision. And, you know, in the end, I will respect that decision. But I, I do think that councillors are likely to ask themselves, now, what is in the best interests of Bristol as a city the people of Bristol in particular and people in general and 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 biodiversity and um, the environment in general so I think um, yeah there's a heavy weight on the planning committee in in making this decision a couple of other things you're looking at here are the Human animal is one of the uh, uh, titles I see on your prospectus here, and also the time bridge. Can you tell us a bit about those? Well, the human animal is is a funny term that was invented by Tom Morris, who is the uh, uh, the director of Bristol Old Vic, and Tom felt very strongly that we need to look at the relationship between um, humans and animals and. What are the things that bring us together, and what are the things that separate us? And what and and what about if you turn the tables between animals and and humans? So I think let the humans out in the lion's pen or something. I think there's a lot of interesting things you can do that virtually too. So you could play games. That's the whole thing with the sort of technology we're talking about. One could play those sort of games, so you could experience what it would have been like being a big cat in a cage um, or a gorilla in a cage or in a glass house or whatever it might be. So um, a human animal is about exploring that relationship. The time bridge is about looking, um, uh, travelling in time. Um, and that doesn't just mean travelling backwards, it can also mean travelling forwards. Why, you know, what would the world look like in 50 years' time if, we, if bees were extinct? Um, so exploring the what ifs, which is yeah, is as educational as you can get. It's dram- you know it can be dramatic, um, and you know I think we're seeing some of the effects of man's stupidity uh, happening now. But being able to see what that looks like in twenty, fifty, a hundred years' time, I think is m- more likely to be a wake up call. Climate modelling, I suppose that's what you're doing. To a certain extent, yeah, and we can draw in the scientists and the naturalists and people to help us with with that exploration. One of the best known um, people who's contributed to this proposal is Alice Roberts. So um, just she she is um, uh, 
TV personality, does history programmes on television. What drew her to the project? Well, she was immediately responsive. With a brief conversation, she thought, this is absolutely wonderful. It's educational, it's uh, environmentally friendly, um, and uh, it is more likely to attract people's interest going forward into the future than um, zoos as they are today. And she's somebody who is a patron of a zoo. She understands absolutely the importance of the education and the conservation that um, comes out of zoos. But we feel that sometimes that, uh, and and she shares this, that sometimes the claims for conservation are... um, uh, 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 Exaggerated. I know. I mean, I don't want to put words into her mouth, but um, I think uh, that we could do so much more for conservation um, than currently than than is the current uh, experience. So um, she, as a Bristolian, as somebody who really cares about the area, who cares about animals, who cares about the environment and biodiversity, is uh, a natural. To, um, to to be a champion for this, and she's a very willing champion. Given that this is the uh, decision which is going to be taken by the zoo, not by the group that's put this Our World Bristol proposal together, do you think if they do knock it back, do you think it's almost got a kind of momentum of its own and it may happen in the city somewhere else anyway? I think what we're doing, the work we're doing, and we've been doing since um, the end of last year... Um, I think is always going to be valuable. We feel that what we're doing is not wasting time. Anything we do to influence the zoo gardens into becoming something better than a housing estate is a win. But the big win is to be able to deliver this project as we currently see it. But this project is developing. It's not... I mean, I would like to say that this is a preliminary prospectus that we have... um, produced because it's one of those things that will always change Um, and that is the great attraction because so many attractions you don't get back to because they're the same as they were last time you went and I think the great thing about an attraction based on the sort of um, principles that this is based on is that it will be forever different. So how do people keep track of this project? What's the best place to, to look to find it, George? Well, we have a website, ourworldbristol.com. So it's called Our World, but Our World Bristol. Bristol is a good brand, and it locates it. So ourworldbristol.com is the place to go and register an interest, um, to leave a comment, um, and uh, we will be updating the, um, the, the website. But also listening to your program <laughs> listening to uh listening to the local media seeing the um you know looking at, at what's happening on social media and um hopefully we will make this into a bit of a national story because i think it has national and international re- relevance Finally, uh, the big story kind of behind this is the way that land's being sold off. I mean, just driving down here today, I see public toilets all closed up, um, looking to be either leased or sold. A lot of the role of the, the, the city council seems to be diminishing. I think that's sadly true. I mean, we're very centrally governed in this country. Gov- and Central government likes to blame local authorities for any failures, and the best way of blaming them is to m- keep them short of cash and um, then uh, rather, than, rather than keeping central government short of cash. And so it looks as if local government is failing. And I'm afraid uh, we are the, uh, amongst the poorest of European nations in terms of local government. So, um, in, for instance, in France, they have um, um, local, local mayors are, in, are much stronger mayors in that they have the resources to... D- put in tramway systems to do things that we simply cannot do in most of our cities. So um, local government is unable to do those things that I believe it should be for sometimes. And um, selling off of public utilities is is criminal waste um, unless it is in aid of creating something better. Um, 
Now, the zoo may not belong to the to local government, it may not belong to Bristol City Council, but it is public in that it does belong in a, in a very real sense to the people of Bristol and um, I think should be considered as a public facility and should continue as a public facility into the future. George Ferguson, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Tony.